I never mourned my family. I've tried to honor them, meditate on treasured memories, but she consumes them, even now. War is a horrible business, and it's dealt with death and tragedy as the usual currency. Seldom is there ever a total victory, an event where the victor ends up completely 100% unscathed, where they experience little loss of life, respect, or in matters of feudal Japan, honor. More often than not, the opposite is the case. Where there is death and tragedy, lives are lost, families are torn apart, and the old ways of living no longer apply. Darkness envelops the land and its people, and with this darkness breeds a type of opportunity that will otherwise never come. A chance to get even, to achieve the heights of wealth and power from the ashes of those that have kept you under the heel of their own power for far too long. A position of perceived inferiority that has been secretly brewing within you, and no one else has been none the wiser. It's that very mentality and the opportunity given by the shield of the Mongol invasion that'll cost Lady Moscow of Clan Adachi her entire family. While her husband, Arinobo Adachi, along with her two sons and all the samurai their clan could manage to rally behind their banner, would go out and face the Mongol threat on Komodo Beach, Lady Moscow would be forced to endure her own battle, one that she'll never be able to escape from. With the men of her clan responding to a threat of a new enemy, Moscow would come to face an old one that she didn't know even existed until it was too late. Until her grandchildren and daughters-in-law were all brutally and swiftly taken from her, with her family estate going on to be completely pillaged, gutted of anything valuable to sell off and make a profit. It was the grandest way to show the time of Clan Adachi is long gone. Kuta's people served your clan. Why would he turn against you? Because he is an ungrateful traitor. While Masako's tales follow her quest for revenge for her fallen loved ones, I think it's crucial to not ignore the series of events that led to the massacre. If we look at the history of Clan Adachi, it's considered to be one of the oldest samurai clans on the island of Tsushima. The founders of the clan were referred to as Great Builders, responsible for the construction of the Golden Temple of Ariake, all the lighthouses across the island, and they even strengthened the fortifications around Castle Shimura and Castle Kanada. Their knowledge and contribution to the island's infrastructure alone was invaluable, providing the clan and its family with a high level of praise across the island. Praise that'll continue to push them into the good graces of the Jito, Lord Shimura, when Clan Adachi would aid in putting down the Yadakawa Rebellion, utilizing their skill and knowledge of infrastructure to best suit their allies. Sometime later, they would go on to also commit soldiers to help Clan Sakai pacify the island of Iki, where they would similarly put to use their knowledge of infrastructure and fortifications to help build Fort Sakai, the base from which Kazumasa would operate from. As their contributions to their samurai clans and the island of Tsushima as a whole would make great strides in making them one of the most powerful and well-known samurai clans on the island, behind the scenes there would be some internal struggles. The clan, just as many other samurai clans, had servants, people that worked closely with the members of the Adachi bloodline. Out of these servants, there would be a specific few that are going to commit deeds that will cost them their privileged position of working within the clan setting the groundwork for a handful of disgruntled people waiting for the opportunity to strike back at their previous employers, providing the weapons, manpower, and reconnaissance necessary to launch the attack on the Adachi estate. We'll go over these servants of importance and their positions before the massacre and what they did to contribute to it, beginning with Sadao. Sadao was the head of the Kuta farmstead. The Kuta farmstead was overseen by Clan Adachi and was tasked with supplying the clan with its food. Sadao's brother Hachi was a local supplier of it as well. At some point, Sadao would become greedy, intentionally withholding rice for himself with the purpose of turning a profit. This would result in the peasant population beginning to starve. They would begin to hold protests against Sadao's leadership, and in secret, Sadao would deal with these protests by hiring a group of bandits to slaughter the protesters. Lady Moscow wouldn't be able to confirm any of this herself until after her family had already been killed, but she would remove Sadao as the head of Kuta Farmstead on the grounds of her suspicion of him hiding something. His removal would be the source of his anger and discontent towards Clan Adachi. It's the very reason he would later join the other conspirators to rip apart the clan he previously served. 
Next, we have Sogen, the first of the conspirators to fall at the hands of Lady Masako immediately after surviving the failed assassination attempt on her life. Sogen was a monk that worked as a sweeper and retainer for the nearby Golden Temple. His opposition towards Clan Adachi appeared to be less personal than his fellow traitors. The only information provided on why he helped to go against Clan Adachi was simply, Clan Adachi was not allowing men of vision to face the changing world. Sogen would operate as a scout. He would visit the Adachi estate the night of the Mongol invasion, performing reconnaissance on the estate before the assassins would swoop in. The assassins, meant to deal with the actual bloodshed, were to be hired by a local fisherman by the name of Kajiwara. Kajiwara grew up working as a retainer for Clan Adachi. He was both skilled and dependable in this position, hence why Lady Masako and Clan Adachi at large would turn a blind eye to his more unsavory actions. It was known that behind closed doors, Kajiwara could be a cruel and vicious man. While it was something the clan was aware of, it wasn't a problem until one day Lady Masako caught Kajiwara in a fit of rage, beating his wife and daughter. Outraged by his actions, Lady Masako would swiftly dismiss Kajiwara of his position within Clan Adachi, effectively exiling him for the disgrace he brought upon himself and the clan. Seething with anger and driven by a desire for vengeance, Kajiwara would become personally responsible for sending the assassins to kill Lady Masako. But, as with all terrible deeds, nothing can come to fruition without the procurement of dependable weapons. Weapons that will be supplied by the Imura brothers. The Imura brothers arguably have a deeper, longer history than any other against Clan Adachi. Their father initially was a supplier for Clan Adachi, until one day he attempted to cheat them out of a shipment of weapons under the guise of Lady Masako's son not paying the amount initially agreed upon. Refusing to fall for Omura's lies, Omura would no longer be a supplier for the clan, and without their business, he and his family would end up on the streets. While living on the streets in poverty, Omura would develop a drinking habit and presumably pass away prematurely, leaving behind his two sons who would inherit their father's unfortunate circumstances and hatred for Clan Adachi. When they would be contacted by the head conspirator, one of the brothers would gleefully accept their chance to avenge their father, supplying the weapon soon to be soaked with the blood of the clan. Last of the conspirators, we have Mai. Mai is a bit of an anomaly, as she's the only one out of all the conspirators spared by the vengeful rage Lady Mosca would be consumed in. While she may not have exactly killed anyone, she was aware of the preparations being made to ensure the killing of Mosca's family. Three years before the Mongol invasion, Mai was a servant to Clan Adachi and even became Lady Masako's lover. Mai's love affair with Masako and her work with the clan would eventually be cut short though, as it was discovered Mai was stealing. Arinobu initially wanted Mai to be flogged as punishment for her thievery, but Masako would intervene, allowing her love to get in the way and spare Mai of any physical punishment. She would instead be banished. Mai would accept her fate, but saw this as betrayal. She would continue to be in love with Masako, but couldn't get over her banishment at the hands of her former lover. When it was time to get contacted by the head of the plot to kill the clan she had once such an intimate relationship with, Mai would agree, albeit her job was to pillage the corpse of the Adachi state, find anything valuable, and sell them at the right time. Originally, the plan was to give them over to the head of the plot to kill Lady Masako, as the items Mai would steal didn't have any real proper value, they were just family heirlooms. But Mai's bad habits of being a thief would die hard. She would instead hold on to these items with the intention of selling them just to make a quick buck for herself. A decision that may have been reinforced by the discovery of Lady Masako had indeed survived the assassination attempt. Mai's change of loyalty wasn't an isolated instance. Upon the discovery of Masako's survival, all conspirators seemingly changed their tunes. Don't be mistaken, they still had no love for Clan Adachi or Lady Masako as a whole. They would instead panic. Set out, for instance, fled Kuda Farmstead, fearful of what Lady Masako would do in the wake of her family's killing. The Omura brothers would blackmail their former leader in an effort to gain enough money to leave the island, an attempt that would go down in vain as they would just be cut down for their betrayal, ordered by the head conspirator, Lady Hana, Masako's older sister. Lady Hana organized everything, from getting in contact with each separate perpetrator, assigning them their duties, and being at Masako's side the night it was all meant to take place. Hana would watch as Lady Masako and her nephew's wives struggled to fight back the assassins she hired to kill them. She would then feign good intentions to take Masako's grandchildren into the wilderness to escape the killers. But once out of sight, Hana would kill Masako's grandchildren. And when she heard Masako survive the attack, she would place the body of a mutilated peasant recently killed by Mongols alongside Masako's dead grandchildren. 
all to make it appear as if she too was the victim of the attacks she had actually planned. As an added measure to sell it all, Hana would place her golden sash on the dead body, giving the illusion it was indeed her. Hana's reason for doing this to her little sister was to get back at her for all the pain and suffering she caused. A lifetime of misery. Hana was married to an abusive drunk set off to live with him in the freezing cold. As if hating the weather wasn't horrible enough, Hana had to endure drunken beatings by her husband who Masako had helped arrange her to be with. As an insulting consolation prize for taking the man Hana wanted. Aranobu Adachi. With all the warriors of Clan Adachi gone, Hana hoped to utilize the anger of those who perceived themselves wronged by Clan Adachi to end the clan once and for all. And with it no longer existing, she would establish a new samurai clan in its place, giving Hana the life and status she always wanted. The life and status taken from her by her little sister. All I saw were my dead grandchildren. Their faces after being cut down, and you were protecting him. So you tried to kill me? Have you lost your mind? I have lost everything! Lady Masako never properly mourned her family. In the wake of the killing, she found the bodies of her loved ones. She held a quick barrier for them to honor their lives and immediately set out to find those responsible. She'd go days without eating, sleeping, or doing anything besides finding the ones deserving of death for the hell that they cast it onto her. She would throw out all definition of honor. At times, becoming so overcome with sadness and anger, she would kill her only leads or scare witnesses so bad it'll cost her valuable information. At one point, she goes back on her word and challenges Jin to a duel for her believing he was protecting a monk who had a hand in her family's killing. Masako! Stand aside, Jin. He betrayed my family. Run! If we fight, the Mongols win. They already won. That monk was Junshin. While he was contacted by Lady Hana at some point in time, he was only guilty of sparing people from more bloodshed, as he mistakenly believed the fisherman Kajiwara had no hand in Lady Masako's tragedy. In the end, Masako doesn't kill her sister. In a display of distraught submission, she hands her sister a blade to end her own suffering. She's killed enough. Now is the time to mourn. Now you have nothing! Ugh! Masako's tale ends with her commenting how she's never mourned her loved ones. She's overlooking her sister's body burning on a pyre, and no matter how hard she tries to recall cherished memories of her loved ones, of her grandchildren that are long gone, she can't. They're just consumed by Lady Hana. She's all that she can think about. Even in death, Hana robs Masako of peace. 